Well, I think, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, yes, uh, it's nice to have a broad coverage of things. It's also uh, also has the disadvantage of not uh, being a super expert on any of those. So uh, I hope you'll forgive if I forgive me if my presentation is very very blurred and zoom out. But I thought that the idea could be to give you more like a perspective of what we're doing in the area of computational acoustics and in particular in musical acoustics. So first of all, why the topic? Why why did we choose? Did I choose to talk about machine intelligence in the context of computational acoustics? Because well, first of all, because there are better people than me to talk about music information retrieval, and you've uh, you've had your your taste, and you're going to have more tomorrow. So I figured I, I might as well try to tell you uh, something slightly different from what you probably were expecting in this kind of context. And uh, so I figured that perhaps the area that we could speak uh, more loudly about is that of computational acoustics. Um, a couple of words about who we are and uh, what we do just uh, very briefly. Uh, we have a, a medium-sized research group at the Politecnico di Milano. The Politecnico di Milano is a well-known university, but well rated. And uh, we have 22 people working in the group uh, as of now but usually changes uh, often getting larger than that. We have uh, several facilities uh, open, like uh, image and sound processing lab. We have experimental recording studio, rendering rooms of various sorts. So we have vibro acoustic lab, um, electroacoustics lab that we are just about to open and a 3D audio room, certified according chamber, the classical things that you need in order to be able to do decent acoustics in, uh, in an academic environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to projects, most of the things that we've done are within European projects. And we've done uh, so far about 30, 32 European projects. And uh, also we got some funding coming from uh, funding agencies from pretty much uh, all over the world. And that's very nice because, well, that allows me to have a relationship or a collaboration with the many international colleagues. Uh, and we learned a lot from them. So I'm very grateful to all of them. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention before I start is the fact that we recently started in 2018-19 a master's program called Music and Acoustic Engineering, which we are very proud of, and it's born of an of a incubation period that lasted over 10 years at the Politecnico di Milano. Now it's a fully grown uh, program with uh, many, many uh, credits devoted to audio, about 150 credits devoted to audio, and a lot of activities, about 80 students, new students every year so we have about 200 students running around on the campus roaming around and making a lot of noise and also playing a lot of musical instruments because as you can expect this this is the environment where you people you know put together their passions uh, in engineering as well as in music um, what do we do? We do uh, mostly computational acoustics, and we focus on uh, interactive spatial audio uh, capturing, processing, and rendering. We do uh, some. Uh, we did activities in the environment, uh, environmental aware acoustics signal processing, uh, acoustic source characterization, modeling, and so on. Uh, for music computing, we also focused on music information retrieval. And, uh, but, uh, you know, our contribution there is a lot more modest. So we're still in a learning curve when it comes to this sort of thing. So that's why we're focusing on the first part of the presentation. There is also some activities that, we do, uh, that we've done in uh, virtual analog modeling and physical uh, sound synthesis. But yeah, like I said, computational acoustics is our is our the goal of today, and which has a strong background in computer vision, which is the other form of expertise we have in the lab. So let me tell you a few things about what we're starting from today. Um, we we'll talk a, a little bit about some solutions to computational acoustics that where uh, the machine learning can become uh, particularly useful in order to uh, solve and overcome the limitations of uh, of the area. Um, let me say just a few words about something that we are quite proud of. It's something that came out uh, now about 12 or 13 years ago. It was uh, basically the idea of using rays, but not in a traditional sense. We were using a, a, a space called the ray space, which is actually uh, a projective space. So we were working in, uh, in, uh, with projective geometry there, and uh, which allows you using a very 
a rather complicated representation of the ray, of the parameters of the rays, uh, which are uh, quat uh, I mean, coordinates in uh, quaternions, basically. And, uh, uh, but it allows you to do a lot of processing in real time and in an interactive fashion. Mm -hmm. So to give you an idea of what uh, this representation, what this representation can do, there is uh, there are quite a few videos showing that you can actually have uh, real time, not only real time ray tracing, but real time computation of the entire sound field in complex environment, complex 3D environments without any acceleration. So this works on, uh, on can work in, in your in your smartphone today. So it's pretty handy because when it comes to doing some uh, interactive rendering, for example, uh, you can do gaming in uh, with 3D audio in real time without any acceleration. This the, this one that you see is an ambisonic implementation of the or a transcoding of that kind of rendering uh, that was done actually in uh, 2010. So it's uh, over over 10 years old. And uh, uh, as far as I know, since then, we haven't seen anything that didn't require acceleration to do that kind of processing in real time in an interactive fashion. But uh, what we're interested in is how to bring this into a different uh, realm. So try to use it for capturing sounds and the rendering sounds, the real sounds. So not just for synthesizing them and uh, creating uh, reverberations, appropriate reverberation in environment for extended reality. So we're talking about how you use microphones in order to capture such sound fields. So uh, the idea is basically inspired by the classical beamforming operations that you do in uh, using arrays of microphones, except instead of using an entire array, we use subarrays as shown in this image here. And uh, each one of them produces an acoustic image similar to the one that you see in the bottom, but you have a number of them. So whenever you put them together, you create an array of acoustic images that are, of course, a lower resolution because we are using fewer microphones for each one of the, the subarrays. So what do we do with that? It's very similar to the idea, I don't know if you remember the Lytro cameras, so arrays of micro cameras in uh, photographic applications, but I'll tell you later about it. So when you do have a bunch of these acoustic images, you can actually pile them up uh, into a higher dimensional space, which is something that we learned from computer vision. And uh, it's called the planoptic processing. And in our case, we call it plain acoustic processing. And the idea of doing that is actually something that was inspired by, I don't know if you've seen The Matrix, when you saw the freeze scenes. And uh, the freeze scene was done with a bunch of cameras. You, you were doing simultaneous acquisitions and then uh, interpolation across cameras. What we're doing, we can do actually more than that. We can pile up all these images into a higher dimensional space, well organized, so that uh, all these things form linear patterns that are easy to discern and separate. So here's how it works. You have um, an array of microphones, for example, in the simplest case. Each one of these arrays is divided into overlapping subarrays. Each one of them produces an acoustic image through an operation on, let's say, just simple beamforming. Then you pile them up through something called a ray space representation. It's a space where each ray is represented by its parameters. So the, uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the tangent of the angle of incidence of each one of the lines. And in the vertical axis, it's, the, it's where the line intersects the array. So basically what happens is that if you have a source, this source will map into a line. So it's the dual space of the, of the geometric space. So any source becomes a line. So why do we do that? Because it's actually pretty cool. Because whenever you take an acoustic ray represented by a line, so y equal to mx plus q in the, in the, without using the... Uh, the uh, uh, how you say projected geometry, we're just using a Euclidean representation for simplicity. Um, then the acoustic source in the MQ space, which is the ray space, becomes basically a line. And uh, when you have, for example, two sources moving about, uh, rotating around each other, what you see in the acoustic image is pretty much what is shown in the image on the right hand side. So you can see that the lines are always distinguishable, even when the two sources are aligned with respect to the array. So there is never occlusion. There is always some subarray that is able to see them as not super, uh, superimposed. 
And uh, uh, so it's pretty cool because you never have problems of uh, blind spots in that case. Um, it's even better when you consider reflectors because a reflector in the parameter space becomes a wedge like the one that you see here. So if this is a source and this is a mirror for the source and this is the image source on the other side of the mirror, what you see is the in the dual space, in the, in the ray space, you see the source represented by this line and this is the source reflected on the wedge-like mirror in the uh, ray space. Now, that's interesting because you, even if you didn't have these two lines uh, that delimit the, the mirror, you can still tell what the shape of the mirror is, which means that with this kind of information, if you have moving sources, you can always uh, reconstruct the shape on the environment, for example, and do some environment inference. And from there, you can do, you know, you can have the environment help you with the processing in space. Um, it's a very cool representation because it has lots of advantages. It, there is one space for all the acoustic images. You can do super resolution. You can do deblurring. You can, you know, recognize artifacts given by aliasing because they are the only curved things that show up in the in the picture. You can do uh, vary the depth of field. You can focus on sources and defocus the others. But most of all, it's inherently object based. So that means that you can really do some separate separation between objects in the acoustic scene, and you can do uh, also a separation between the processing, which can occur in, um, in parallel, in using hardware, using even your, your smartphone, as I said before, because it's very efficient, and uh, the pattern analysis happens like image processing as a separate application that is independent of the processing, the heavy processing that you might do in the sound field camera. So um, basically, we turn the problem of acoustic processing into a problem of pattern analysis, which is probably more close, let me closer to the idea of uh, audio processing for music information retrieval, for example, because you are analyzing patterns that form in a higher dimensional space that represents in a very simple and efficient and layered way the entire uh, representation of the acoustic scene. Um, this is actually something that we pushed a little further uh, by developing in collaboration with Eventai, the Manifold Labs uh, in, the, in the US, arrays, portable arrays of 16 microphones each, which can be piled together, synchronized, they work in, uh, in uh, using the Dante uh, protocol. So they synchronize, they power up over, over Ethernet, so we can have 64, 128 microphones easily, they don't cost very much. And, uh, uh, and so you can do interesting things like capturing the entire sound field during a concert as we've done already in several other occasions. Um, you can also reverse the, the paradigm by developing a number of uh, loudspeaker arrays. And these loudspeaker arrays are actually um, arrays of subarrays. So it's like arrays of acoustic projectors, uh, so directional acoustic projectors. And uh, it works exactly the same way, but of course, the paradigm is reversed in that case. And you can, you know, combine them together in such a way as to do cylindrical arrays, planner arrays, all kinds of interesting things. Mm -hmm. So these are some examples that we developed in the past. I'm, I'm just going to show you very quickly what kind of applications uh, have been developed so far on this sort of things. And then we're going to talk about how the machine learning comes in the picture. So, um, well, first of all, source uh, detection and localization is one of the applications that you might want to do. Um, and that's very easy to do because, as I said before, each source corresponds to a line. So uh, any pattern analysis solution, image processing solution that allows you to identify lines will allow you to extract that information on the location of the source. Um, remember, there is not just the direction of arrival, but also the location in terms of distance of the source from the array. So it works best in near field. If it's in far field, obviously you're, you're going to have to get content with the, the direction of arrival of the source. But the, the whole plan acoustic idea is meant to be used in near field, uh, which is exactly where many applications of computational acoustics uh, tend to fail. Um, also, by the way, uh, this can be done in uh, super resolution because, of course, you're interpolating a line. You already know it's going to be a line. So that helps you also improving the resolution and the accuracy of the localization. Mm -hmm. 
accuracy of the localization. You can also do some denoising because, of course, you know it's going to be uh, a line, so you can also suppress using specific masks the noise outside. You can recuperate the shape of the room with the idea that I showed you before. You remember it was a bunch of uh, wedges. So by moving the sources or using arrays, uh, you can always explore the space and figure out the shape of the room, even to the point of recognizing the position of a corner or a small corner that other solutions that have been developed in the literature, even by ourselves, uh, failed to do before. Now you can actually see the corners of the room. Um, another thing that we did that was kind of cool, it was in 2014 presented at ICASP as a public demo, was the first wave field synthesis solution that worked in an interactive fashion. Uh, and it was capable and it is still capable of rendering a, a, a virtual environment. So you have the, maybe some of you saw it. I don't know if you were there in Florence on that year, but you people would come in and use the Kinect in order to move walls around the room and then move around in this region to hear how the wave field synthesis would work in real time taking into account the positions of the wall that you that you placed. And that's something that with with your synthesis normally you can't do, but with this particular solution, it's possible to do uh, easily and act, uh, most of all in interactive fashion in real time. Um, more of these applications are in the area of uh, musical acoustics, which is an area that was mentioned before by Gail. Uh, yes, we, we do have a lab, one of the laboratories in the Violin Museum of Cremona. So that's where we have fun on one hand, uh, studying uh, historical musical instruments. At the same time, we're scared to death to handle them. I mean, we recently had handled an instrument that came actually from the UK, from uh, Eshmolian Museum of, uh, in Oxford. That was the Messiah, the famous Messiah. It's, there are legends about it, and there are legends about the possible pricing of that instrument that it ranges between 50 and 100 million euros. So that gives you an idea of what the palpitations that we went through when we had to do the measurement on that object. We had the police outside of the laboratory, of course, and it was really complicated to do. Anyway, but um, uh, it, that's a, an interesting place to do measurements. And uh, one of the things that we were doing was also to extract information on the radiance patterns during the performance. So this is uh, an application that could be done fairly easily with the well, no, not really fairly easily, but it could be done readily, that's where that way, using the plan acoustic camera, doing the radiance estimation, uh, using the tracking of the position of the orientation of the instrument. In practice, what you do is to use the plan acoustic cameras to uh, measure the points of the radiance pattern in 3D by basically looking over the plane acoustic image along the position of the source. So if you look at the profile of the luminance of this image, you'll find that that corresponds to the, plane, to the radiance pattern. Uh, this is the setup in the anechoic chamber in the Violin Museum that we have in the Violin Museum. Of course, under the chin, we have also uh, gyroscopes to reconstruct the, the, the orientation of the violin. And, uh, the this is the last very sorry this is the last version using two cameras so we didn't need, need to use the kinect but the only video we have is when we are still using a kinect for the operation so you can see that the musician moves and uh, as the musician moves the radiance pattern is being built on the fly and it's uh, by the way, this is not a violin player, you can tell. Uh, and despite that, actually, the, <laughs> surprisingly enough, the radiance pattern turns out to be fairly independent of how badly you play it. So uh, we were all surprised about that. So I it could even be me, the person who does the measurement, believe it or not. Anyway, uh, these are the radiance patterns. Um, there are articles that came out on transactional audio speech and language processing about uh, the, the accuracy of the method. Um, and uh, these are examples of radiant patterns that can be extracted from there as a function of the frequency. And the cool, the cool thing is, is this, because you can do feature analysis on the radiance patterns. 
This is actually low level feature analysis. It's basically, you can extract information on the brightness of the musical instruments as a function of the uh, emission direction. And uh, we compared two uh, instruments in particular. We compared many of them. And, uh, and actually there is an article on Journal of Acoustic Society of America coming out on the study of comparison of many historical violins. But two in particular kind of uh, hit my imagination. One is the Cremonese by Stradivarius, uh, 1715. And the other is the Guarneri del Gesù Stauffer. It's uh, basically the same violin that Paganini was using. Not exactly the same, but the, the twin violin that Paganini was using. He called it the cannone, the cannon, because of the power of that instrument. Um, uh, someone defined one as being the Botticelli of the violins, the Stradivarius, and the other the Caravaggio of the violins because it's very dark sounding. And you can tell the difference because the Botticelli or the Stradivarius has two brightness directions. So slightly behind, slightly in the front, and, the, and while the Guarneri is more like a Caravaggio painting, so it points forward and that's it. It's very dark in all other possible directions. So he was right. Um, Uto Ugi was right when he when he assessed the difference between the two when when he said that. Now, what is missing in this representation of the ray space, which we like so much? Well, we like it because we did it, uh, of course. So we we need we, one has to brag for something in, in his or her life, right? And but uh, unfortunately, the ray space has still quite a few limitations, and uh, it's very very flexible because it, it's ready to accommodate extended realities and this sort of thing. It's interactive, object-based, and low processing cost, but it still is quite demanding in terms of numbers of transducers that are involved in this representation. So there is an issue of uh, invasivity because you need to be surrounded by, or you either have a very wide array of, uh, of uh, loudspeakers, of microphones, or you need to have something that is made of multiple arrays around you. Um, it, it doesn't require exactly to be entirely surrounded, like in wave field synthesis, by transducers. But you need to have multiple uh, arrays, at the very least, in order to be immersive as an experience. So there is an issue of cost, and then there is an issue of invasivity of the entire solution. So how do we get around it? That's the main problem. You can do some work of interpolation in the plan acoustic in the ray space, but it's always kind of limited in its uh, performance. We did many experiments in uh, removing some of the plane acoustic cameras or some of the uh, acoustic cameras that form the plane acoustic cameras, increasing the sparsity of the sensors. And you do obtain a much more blurred plane acoustic image as a result. And you can perform some form of interpolation over it in order to reconstruct the entire sound field. But you can only go so far with that. And of course, this is the time that where we need to sharpen our machine learning knives and see whether we can do better using such tools. And as a matter of fact, uh, the moment in which you consider mo more reasonable setups is the moment in which you have to go for such solutions. Um, reasonable setups would consist of sparse distributions of microphones or microphone clusters, which can be arbitrarily placed. Just imagine your living room. And if you are a little bit like me, you probably have no reflecting walls. Everything is cluttered with books everywhere. You have all kinds of clutter everywhere. So you, there is no room for additional speakers, uh, let alone for arrays. So you have to do what you can with the holes that you find in whatever space you have on the walls. So uh, at the end, you can be really picky about it unless unless you are a Swede and maybe you have one of those Ikea-like rooms where there is nothing in the room. I assume none of us is like that, not even the Swedish guys or, girl, or gals. Um, so um, yeah, that's the reality. We have to do with the sparse distribution of microphones or clusters that are placed wherever you find a room for them. Also, you, whenever you deal with numerous sensors or emitters, you... Mm, you don't have the possibility to calibrate them so well. So some of them will be emitting more power or less power. Some of them will be more or less sensitive. They might not be accurately placed. Some of them might, be, might even be malfunctioning. So you have to be able 
to deal with uh, not only sparsity, but even errors or missing data. So that's where probably the, 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 um, the machine learning comes at handy in that case. Um, an example is uh, the following. Now, instead of seeing lines um, in, in the ray space, we use a more compact version. It's called the spherical, uh, spherical ray space, where instead of seeing line, you see this sort of shapes. They're also model-based, so they're easy to identify identify. So this is an example where you have a rich set of microphone arrays. Uh, we, we use something that we call the ray space transform. It's sort of a short space-time Fourier transform that computes the ray space very, very quickly. I haven't told you about it, but you know, it really doesn't matter for the purpose of this talk. Uh, so let's call it ray space transform, something that maps the information coming from microphones onto the ray space. And this is a compact version of it, where these are the lines that come out. You can see that there is a, some sort of a sinusoidal curve, which correspond, which is the equivalent of the line that I was talking about before. So you can tell, even an, with, without using any algorithm, there is a, some source that generates that sinusoidal shape in the ray space, which is what we expect a source to do, even a low resolution like, such as in this case. Um, however, the true situation that we have is not with a rich set of microphones. This, we use it to generate a data set, if anything. Or you can do it maybe simply by simulation, by, by generating environments in order to train the nets. Um, and then uh, you have, a, in the real situation, you have a sparse set of microphones, very few of them uh, arbitrarily placed. Each one of them uh, could be a, either a cluster of microphones, in which case you have information on the radiance pattern of the, of the cluster, or it could be a simple microphone, in which case you have an integration around the angle of all the information or radiance that is received by the microphone itself. So it's like a line integral, or maybe in this case, a sinusoidal integral of the entire sound field. So there is a, the, a little bit of the equivalent of the Raiden uh, transform that you use for tomographic application, but that, that is beyond the purpose of this. Anyway, with the, uh, with the rich set of microphone arrays, we can generate a data set, and then we can compare the output coming from the sparse microphone using GCC and then using a CN, uh, convolutional neural network, which generates a very dirty output, a very incomplete output. And then using a comparison between the incomplete output and uh, the desired output, you can do an update of the weights. So this is, uh, uh, iteratively, this will become the uh, best approximation of the sound field that, or sorry, of the ray space representation of the sound field that you are considering. Then you can take that and using uh, a UNET, for example, a convolutional autoencoder of some sort, uh, you can uh, uh, actually work the second layer and do peak extraction on the desired ray space transform, compare it with the uh, um, reconstructive ray space transform that you had before, and then you can do weight update through that comparison. And finally, you are able to localize the source which is this shape that comes out of the convolutional neural network. Uh, and that's actually extremely close to the original one, close enough that you can actually localize the source. So even if you do have just a sparse set of microphones, you can still do a lot by using the representation in the ray space and appropriately designed convolutional neural networks. Um, this is the diagram that kind of summarizes this kind of uh, situation. But um, uh, let me just give you some other ideas. Uh, another idea is this one where we use a lot of uh, machine learning in this case. And we recently published this article on uh, the Nature Scientific Reports um, called uh, um, uh, A Data-Driven Approach to Violin Making. Since uh, Gail mentioned, again, uh, the activities that we do also in the laboratory, uh, violin, uh, sorry, Musical Acoustics Lab in the Violin Museum of Cremona, um, we actually focused a lot on the problem of how to do if possible, better than Stradivarius. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, the, um, the idea was really to try hard to see if you can actually improve on Stradivarius or whatever the historical luthier you might consider. So um, 
this is the reasoning that is behind it. Uh, luthiers do have complete control over two things. Material, so they can, which is incomplete control on that because they have to choose among available woods, but they do have some degree of control over the material, but they do have complete control over the shape because they can carve the plates, the, the wood as they please. Now, how do they use this control? Well, normally luthiers are very you know, they tend to follow recipes and then improve on the recipes. They, mm, there are some of them that are so illuminated that actually can come up with new ideas, but they also have to deal with tradition and tradition usually doesn't want you to be very dramatic in your changes. So uh, what they tend to do is to follow the recipes of expert luthiers from the past most of the times. And uh, I have to say that very often a luthier doesn't have a physical understanding of the, of the process. They have experiential understanding of the process. But uh, what we're trying to do is to give them some tools in order to improve on their art. Uh, so the idea is to use standard statistical learning tools um, that will allow to predict modal frequencies of violin tops, for example, from the geometric parameters of the wood on the shape of the, of the, of the plate itself. And then uh, basically do it fast enough that you can actually do some optimization of the shape, which means having a form of simulation in the loop. Because if you wanna be able to do some optimization of shape, your simulation has to be so fast that it becomes interactive optimization. That's the, the very idea. But how do you do fast simulation when normally to simulate a plate, it takes a week of computation time. Um, well, that's where the machine learning comes uh, to play. So um, the idea of this work was to show that there is a way to speed up using machine learning, machine intelligence, um, to speed up the process dramatically. I'm talking about orders and orders of magnitude faster. Um, and at the same time, uh, insert, it, insert the simulation in the loop to do plate tuning, to do optimization of the shape, to uh, obtain the same sound that you obtain from a historical violin using a different wood by adapting the shape of the new violin in order to obtain the same sound, just to give an idea. So these are some of the possibilities that are now possible using this particular approach. So what we did was to figure out, first of all, a parametric model of uh, the shape of the violin. And uh, we used actually a very interesting drawing that was uh, developed by Enrico Ceruti. It was in the, in the workshop of this luthier, uh, uh, his name was, uh, was Enrico Ceruti, that showed the outline of the violin as a series of connected arcs of circles. And actually to see this a little better, we reproduce the shape here. And actually you have nine circles that can be used to generate the violin outline. So you have a bunch of degrees of freedom, center and radius of each one of the parameters. Keep in mind, you have nine times three parameters, so radius and X, Y location of, the, of each one of the circle. Uh, so in principle, it should be 27 parameters, but in practice, it's fewer than that. It's like, I think it's 20, 21, because these lines have to be constrained to connect to each other. So that's how that's done. And as far as the shape of the, of the bulging of the shape of the, of the plate, we actually fitted uh, uh, a sixth order polynomial. Uh, it's the black solid line that you see right here on top of the, a scanning of one of the possible violins. You could have taken any, any violin, but since we had the Messiah at hand, we used the scanning of the Messiah. So the, what you see here is the, the, the dots represent the scanning of the Messiah. Here are the Fs, so there's a little hole, and we used a, an interpolation of the six, uh, sixth order polynomial interpolation to fit that. Now, uh, that also we parameterized, so we came up with some uh, knobs that we can turn around. And uh, that was our parametric model for the shape where you can build fat, uh, skinny, uh, weird shaped uh, uh, violins, but also traditional ones. And so what we did was to generate uh, 1700 shapes and run over 1500 of them 
uh, a simulation based on finite elements, which took quite a long time, as you can imagine. So we had to use a lot of training, sorry, a lot of uh, simulation time on a fast computer. But then we used that to uh, train a very simple and that surprisingly simple, but sorry, this is another example of parameterization that we use for guitars, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, um, and these are three examples of shapes on the case of the violin, a skinny one, a fat one, a reasonably regular one. And uh, as I mentioned before, we use a very simple neural network, the, probably the simplest one you can think of, to see whether this would give us a reasonable prediction of the various modal parameters of the violin itself. And uh, actually the results was quite surprising. The R2 was uh, uh, 0.977. So the result was very, very, very accurate. So there is a, this method allows you actually to obtain a prediction, an immediate prediction uh, that allows you to change the 20 parameters of the violin or the shape of the violin in such a way as to obtain a certain distribution of resonances and modes in uh, the response of the, of the musical instrument, maybe matching, for example, a historical violin. Now, if you have a method for saying, what is your objective function? So what is the uh, quality of the objective function? Well, the, the quality measurement that you implement in your objective function that says this violin sounds amazing, and of course we don't have it, um, then maybe you can use that as a, as a metric in order to do optimization of the shape in order to maximize that objective function. So in, in, it doesn't work anymore in trying to match the sound of an existing violin, but you can actually improve on the quality. So we still can't do it. We, we can do the matching, but we don't have yet a metric to do the optimization of the sound, but we are on the good, uh, you know, on, uh, on, the, on the right way because uh, we can always try to use questionnaires and uh, interviews to say what to, and figure out some mechanism for uh, inferring perhaps an optimal, uh, let's say, objective function that can be used in order to optimize the shape of the violin itself. But this is still an open problem. Um, uh, I know I'm, I'm in, I'm, I don't have much time left, but let me just show you a few more applications that we're where we're using machine learning. Uh, one is uh, near field acoustic holography, which started again from uh, uh, the applications of the violin. You might wonder why are we investing so much time on the violin. Well, not only be because we do have a uh, passion for it, but and because we have a laboratory there, but also because whatever you can do on a violin, you can easily do on an industrial level. We are actually using many of these techniques for industrial applications, uh, using even ultrasound um, sensors and MEMS sensors of some sort. So we have projects with ST Microelectronics, with Inventum and several other companies that are interested in uh, the you know, the, the, on using these particular solutions for industrial applications or for uh, commercial applications of other sorts. Uh, everybody knows that when you deal with musical instruments, you are considering probably one of the most complicated problems ever. And uh, so if you learn to do well there, you can actually do there, do well in many other fields. So again, uh, what's near field acoustic holography? You saw a picture before, for example, of near field acoustic holography used to characterize the rolling noise produced by tires. So we had a project with the Pirelli uh, company to assess the causes of, uh, of rolling sound, which is responsible for uh, a lot of the noise in, um, in urban settings and also outside. Um, and that, this kind of solution was being used in that particular case. But uh, in the case of the violin, what do you have? You have a, a surface that emits uh, uh, vibrations. Uh, so there is a coupling between the plate and the air. You have pressure waves, which are sensed by an array of microphones, like a surface of microphones on top of the surface. The direct problem is the forward acoustic propagation, but we're interested in the inverse problem, which is uh, basically 
the backward acoustic propagation. We want to figure out from the signals acquired by the microphone how the surface was vibrating. That's called NAH, H, called therefore near field acoustic holography. Now, uh, there are what we are interested in doing. Well, we have solutions based on dictionary driven solutions, all kinds of stuff, and that's what we were using industrially. But we recently tried to work on uh, an approach based on machine learning. So um, the idea was to propose a fully data driven approach in the context of uh, near field acoustic holography, built by building a data set to train neural network. Again, we're using uh, uh, convolutional neural networks and then validating the model by simulating experimental measurement setups. Uh, so here's how it works. You have sound pressure generated by the violin uh, or whatever surface you're considering. Uh, then uh, you are, uh, of course, feeding into a neural network that has been appropriately trained in order to give you the source, the, the mapping of the source vibration that matches as much as possible what uh, you are expected to see if you use, for example, a laser vibrometer, um, but starting from the signals of the microphones only. And of course, this requires a certain amount of work in building the data set, uh, developing a structure that is capable of learning, and then validating the whole thing. And as you can imagine, we decided to use, because this seemed to be the most practical solution, a convolutional autoencoder implemented uh, in, a, in a slightly less uh, flexible fashion using a UNET, uh, but uh, which is very efficient in the way it works. And uh, we uh, train, we generated using COMSOL, which is a multi-physics simulation software, a bunch, 48,000 images uh, uh, training images of the vibration of surfaces. Um, and then, uh, uh, and also the signals come into the microphones as well. And then from there, we were able to do uh, the training of the convolutional neural network in order to obtain the final result, uh, which, uh, which is the one that you see on the right hand side. Surprisingly enough, uh, we got pretty good results because we're talking about two or 3% error on the values. Uh, and also as far as shapes are concerned, we have about 95% matching. And which is actually pretty good because with this, you can actually do a fast prediction of uh, uh, the behavior of the surface, even using uh, a limited number of microphones. So without having a complete, you can work in super resolution in that case and without even having a complete set of microphones for the acquisition of the data. Uh, let me just say the very last thing, if you have patient enough for a couple of minutes, um, a more traditional application of machine learning in our case. There are many more things because we also wor worked on uh, virtual miking using machine learning, sound field synthesis using deep learning, reconstructing speech from uh, CNN embeddings, uh, audio in painting and prediction, forward prediction, all kinds of things that are either uh, been recently published or are coming out in these days. But there is one thing that was kind of fun to do that which has again something to do with uh, uh, what Gail mentioned before, which is the idea of uh, applying it to the case of the violin. You know how difficult it is to describe the quality of the timbre of a musical instrument and in particular of instruments that are persistently excited such as violins or saxophones. How do you describe them? Well, what we did was to, well, build some sort of a, dictionary of terms that are mostly used some sort of a um, we interviewed many luthiers many violin play, uh, players and they all tended to agree we generated uh, an ontology of representative of names that seem to capture the clusters that uh, somehow are more representative of the timbre of the musical instrument so that was a lot of interviews run uh, over hundreds of people then um, we did feature-based analysis based on machine learning algorithm, traditional, very simple things because this was done a few years ago. Um, and uh, we used a specific performance call protocol that were in the semi-anechoic uh, room that we have in the Violin Museum. Um, we pre-selected uh, some features that are performance invariant so that they don't depend very much on the player. 
And uh, we tried, however, to use the same violinist, the same bow on the violin. It's very important because the bow has great influence on the quality of sound. And uh, following a very specific protocol that was developed after many attempts. So first three strings and single notes and chromatic scales. And then we did something that we had a lot of fun doing. It was seven excerpts from uh, Paganini's Capricci number 24, which are probably the most famous Capricci. You probably are familiar with them, which actually we picked because they have a selection of performative styles that were interesting to assess one by one. So uh, we had uh, we went into our rendering room. We had a bunch of people uh, filling out questionnaires, trying to assess, to give ground truth or at least, uh, yeah, let's call it ground truth uh, on uh, such parameters, such terms. And then we put them all together and we trained neural networks on prediction. And uh, this is what we got. So the green line represents predictions and the red line represents annotations. And the, the terms that we picked from the, the, the ontology are warm, sweet, full, soft, deep, and bright. And uh, we did a lot of comparisons, which, as a matter of fact, we haven't published yet. We're yet to publish. We have a backlog. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see the comparison between, for example, the average of historical violins and the average of contemporary violins, but not any contemporary violins. We picked the winners of the World Triennial uh, violin making competition because we're lucky enough that the violin is preserving each one of them starting from I mean covering basically the entire uh, past century. So uh, interestingly enough, there is a difference between the behavior of historical violin and the behavior of contemporary violin. Contemporary violin tend to be very bright, less deep, and uh, while the historical violin tend to be on average deeper, sweeter, warmer, and fuller. So it's kind of interesting, but uh, of course there are differences from instrument to, to instrument. And you saw, for example, the difference between the Cremonese and the uh, Stauffer Guarneri del Gesù. Uh, so these are all, you know, they have to be taken with some caution because they are averaging out over very, very different instruments from each other. But this is the cool thing. And I thought that I would show you because we picked uh, this time we picked high level feature. We did some uh, uh, neural network training and we used uh, bright as a feature and deep as a feature, not like before, uh, but we, and we did it for four cases, the Cremonese, the Botticelli, the Stauffer, which is the you know, Caravaggio, and then uh, the average of historical, the average of modern instrument for both features. But this time we did it for each performative uh, style. So, uh, this, you know, in, incipient, arpeggio, legato, sforzato, pizzicato, passionate, ethereal, and so on. And it's interesting to compare. And uh, the Cremonese wins pretty much on all categories, the, except for the Stauffer, that seems to be uh, stronger in uh, passionate and uh, plucked, for example, pizzicato. So it's a, it kind of tends to match the perception of people because the interviews tended to give this kind of uh, uh, conclusions as well. So you do have some uh, meters that can, some uh, metrics that can be used in order to assess or objectivize uh, things that otherwise would be very hard to define and to model. Okay, well, I think I'm gonna stop here. There is a lot more that I could show, but I think I'm already beyond the limit. Um, as a conclusion, what I'd like to simply say is that, well, uh, computational acoustics in general is a very traditionally oriented type of field of research. So it hasn't really changed for many years. And uh, the reason being that, you know, when you use this sort of tools, in the context of industrial applications where you know lives are at stake and uh, you can't make really a lot of mistakes people tend to be careful they develop a certain uh, you know caution in uh, adopting new tools and stuff like that however in the past few years just very few years things have begun to change and evolve very rapidly and uh, uh, machine learning has had a huge influence 
uh, on all possible fields of research. And this was not exam exempt from this influence. And I'd like to say that we're going to see a lot more coming up in the near future, especially if the push is towards uh, interactive uh, extended reality applications where you want to see not only uh, virtual environments, but also virtualized environments from uh, multiple realities mixed together in the same place. And um, so we're going to need, in my opinion, uh, tools that are object-based, flexible, fast, but at the same time, also tools of machine learning that allow you to deal with reduced uh, acquisition and rendering complexity. And I think I'm done. I can stop here and I apologize for the delay.